continuing uh, within our program. And our next presenter is from Bulgaria's most known astrologer, Roman Kolev. Uh, is he with us right now? Is he online? Yes, it is. Um, is here? One moment. All right. Yes, he's coming. Hi, Roman. Hi. Hey. It's, good. Hey. <laughs> it's, it's good to see you. I just want to read a quick bio, present you, then you can start. And Ruman Kulev is a world renowned astrologer, scholar who translates and publishes uh, publi unpublished astrological texts from Akkadian, Greek, Latin, and Arabic. He is the author of the academic book, The Babylon Astrolabe, with a projector director, Professor Simo Parpula. The book, which represents the oldest astrological text dating back to the uh, 5500 BC. Kolev developed the unique astrological software, Placidus for primary directories and ancient astrology. Title of his speech today is The Omens and Historical, historical Events in Ancient Mesopotamia. Hello, nice to see you. Uh, just uh, to say that actually, uh, you said I think uh, 155 BC, and uh, yes. the dating, the dating of the Babylonian astrolabe was made by the positions of the constellations uh, as they rise over the horizon, because mm -hmm. they can change this because of the precession. And uh, the exact dating, mathematical, astronomical, uh, came to 5,500 BC. 5,500 BC. 5,500, so yes. 5,500 BC, this is like the prehistory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like in 5,500 BC, actually, we have some uh, good historical data. This was... Uh, the time when the first temple, the first Sumerian temple, mm -hmm. was built in Eridu in Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the time actually when the Sumerians started their civilization. 5500 BC, the first temple. Well, this first temple was like uh, two meters on two meters uh, kind of uh, a hut, but, you know, still something. <laughs> yes, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, also, this was uh, this was very, very interesting time because 5,500 BC also is the time of the beginning of the so-called Danubian, early Danubian civilization or culture, something in between because, you know, they had agriculture, they mm -hmm. had uh watering of uh like artificial uh, watering melioration and they had also signs like maybe around several hundred signs which is like a uh, proto a uh, proto uh writing so dunovsky dunavian Duna, uh, the the nubian uh early the nubian uh civilization or culture it's uh they you know it's uh different uh how they how they call it but yeah. nevertheless uh this mm -hmm. is uh this was uh i think one of the one of the main uh missions that i have had and that i was very uh, happy and thankful to god that uh he made me he made it possible to complete this almost impossible mission. Impossible. Yes, thank almost. you for that. Thank you for uh, this research and mission. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, okay, now. Okay, now will you I be sharing can... the screen? Do you have uh, anything to yeah, show oh, yeah, us? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. I have a lot to show you. Uh, all right, so yeah, I can share the screen. All right, I will do it uh, soon. So. Basically, what I'm going to, to talk about is uh, the so-called uh, historical omina or historical omens, um, which um, um, are 
record it, record it in writing, in uh, uh, cuneiform or uh, or any other ancient uh, language. And I mean by this historical omena, historical omens, I mean uh, celestial events, celestial events which were observed on the sky, which were recorded, which were discussed by the contemporary priests, scholars, uh, and which were connected with historical events. Okay. Uh, actually, the the most early so-called historical omina, where we have celestial events recorded, and this is connected with real real historical events. Uh, this dates uh, to uh, maybe uh, Sir Gon the Great, Sir Gon the Great and his successors. There, uh, there are some early recorded omina, which is uh, for um, uh, lunar eclipses and they connected the lunar eclipses with the death of the current king. And there were like several such uh, correlations. Uh, there is a lunar eclipse and boom, the king, the king of, of uh, Akkad is dead. The next king comes and after some years, the same thing repeats. So um, these are the most early, but but it is not, uh, they are recorded like uh, omina without mentioning of the particular time of the particular kings in which are involved. There are no details. Uh, so I don't think that they are real historical omina uh, which are textually supported. Uh, you know, this, this omina, they just say, okay, if there is a lunar eclipse in this day, in this lunar month, uh, uh, and with this condition, then the king will die. So this is the whole thing. And and uh, uh, although that it is uh, a result, it is a result of a celestial event, which the 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 people living then connected by association with historical with something event which really happened. Um, then this is probably the case, but it is not uh, uh, textually supported. It is not uh, written. It is not discussed. Uh, so um, one one omen which I remember, which is actually not preserved the whole omen, just part part of uh, part of this historical omen is preserved, relates to Sargon the Great. Sargon the Great, who uh, is dated to 2300 BC. All right. So Sargon the Great, uh, he was a great, uh, a great warrior. I believe he ruled for 40 years, and he uh, uh, in he first unified Mesopotamia, and then he uh, conquered. Uh, everything around like the i think he conquered uh, the present day turkey syria uh i think he went even to egypt uh almost almost uh, he conquered even uh, uh egypt and uh, uh of course the present day iraq iran all these things were under sargon the great and the omen the omen which is uh, uh partially preserved in uh, in cuneiform text is uh, is saying something like um, when Venus then follows destroyed text a little bit uh, in the north again destroyed text Sargon the king of the world destroyed text in the northern lands so uh we have here these keywords venus 
in the north, Sargon the Great, the northern lands. So what we can reconstruct here is that there was a, an omen involving Venus and uh, uh, Sargon the Great in this time conquered the northern lands. And this, and this event involving Venus may be that Venus rose in the, in the north, in the northeast, of course, uh, probably uh, something of the case. Um, so um, we should not forget also that uh, that uh, Sargon um, um, called himself called himself also the beloved of Venus, the beloved of Inama, uh, Naram Dingir Inama. Uh, so um, he 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 was connected actually the whole first Sargonid dynasty, this uh, this dynasty that uh, was uh, founded by Sargon the Great and which thrived for around 200 years. Uh, this dynasty was connected with uh, Venus, with uh, Ishtar, and with the moon, with uh, the divinity sin. Uh, so um, it was uh, this um, connections there. So there was like, a, uh, of course, some legends about this uh, Sargonic kings. Uh, very, 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 very interesting uh, legends. Like um, there was, uh, I think, the great son or the, the great, great son of Sargon the great uh, was called naram sin which uh, which means uh, the beloved of the moon god uh, and and he uh, and he was uh, fighting some in some invaders um, and he was and he was fighting with some kingdoms around there and uh, he was asking uh, the priests, the astrologers, the magicians about uh, a good time to go on a, on a campaign. And the answer was, okay, now there is, this is not good time, wait. Okay, Naram Sin waited for some time, then he asked them again. And then again talking, all right, now it's not the good time, wait. So in the in the end, <clears throat> Naramsin, king of the world, king of the of the four corners, was uh, you know was tired of waiting, and he uh, just uh, started uh, the campaign, saying, "Okay, look, look, guys, does the lion consult with you before?" He goes on his mission to find prey. Does the tiger uh, does uh, rituals before he goes out? I will go like a wild beast on my path. So this is what what he said you know, to this priest. So so Naramsin went on this campaign and and he lost. Yeah, uh, there was uh, there were several battles. He lost big time, so many many warriors of his uh, army were killed, and uh, and he fought several several battles. He was you know like uh, pushing on, and he lost and lost, and then uh, when he was left almost without an army, and coming back uh, tired and injured on his horse. Then Venus from the sky started talking to him. And Ishtar, Ishtar, the divinity of harmony, the divinity of love and of friendship was talking to the king of the world, Naram Dingir Sin. And Ishtar was telling him, hey, look, Naram Sin, forgive everybody. 
don't go to war. Leave these guys alone. Because if they do something wrong, Enlil, Enlil will punish them. Um, and actually, the message that Ishtar was saying to Naram Sin was, uh, well, the same message as Jesus Christ. You know, love everybody. Uh, don't uh, don't hate anyone. Don't don't have anger. Uh, be friends with everyone. Um, and this this was actually the same message, um, which was delivered <laughs> two thousand two thousand uh, um, BC. All right. So uh, so very very interesting uh, interesting legions there. In interesting stuff. Uh, there is a book uh, published, Legions of the of the Sargonic uh, Kings. Mm. <clears throat> so, um, all right. So now, let's now go to our main main topic because this was just a preamble. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's now go to our main topic. A little bit of clarification. I suppose that most of you, most of you uh, know what is Babylonian astrology, how it is different from the other types of astrology. But you know, in short, I can I can uh, uh, put something here, like uh, Babylonian astrology is. The astrology of the real sky, the astrology of the real communication with the sky, observation of the real sky with our own unaided eyes. And uh, it is the observation of the celestial events which we can observe on the sky and observation of the events on the earth and the events in us and around us. So this is a direct observation of the unity of the cot. Direct observation of the unity between sky and earth. Events on the sky and events on the earth. And, uh, and this is again, I will not be tired to underscore this. This is direct observation with our own unaided eyes. Uh, the sky is a sphere. It is the celestial sphere. It is in three dimensions. And um, there are a lot of things there. A lot of things which the computer programs will not um, rep represent. Even uh, even uh, such programs like uh, like mine, for example, where you can see I you you will see now. Most of you know them. Where you can see also the stars. You can see something like a, a two dimension or even pseudo three dimension uh and and of course uh, i have also um a model where you can see the celestial sphere with all the stars with everything even even this kind of computer programs cannot cannot give you a representation of the real sky because there are events which are happening on the real sky which Computer programs cannot predict, like uh, let's say uh, a meteor. Uh, okay, uh, somebody is is born right now, and there is a powerful meteor or even meteorite, you know, splashing in light, uh, coming from from one star and uh, disappearing in another constellation. So, does this have a meaning? Well, of course it. It has a meaning. Everything has a meaning here in this life. 
in this world, in your life, everything, the the uh, the most little detail has a meaning. So uh, sometimes I I talk also about these two two major schools in philosophy. Uh, one one school will will tell, all oh, right, well, it does not have a meaning, right? Like nothing has a meaning. Okay, somebody is born in a full moon. Well, this does not mean anything. Well, somebody is born when Venus is rising as a morning star. No, well, no, no, this is this this doesn't have a meaning. Okay, somebody is killed by a, by a lightning. Well, this is by chance. All right, um, what else? Somebody uh, wins ten million from the lottery. Well, this is by chance. Well, <laughs> uh, so this school of thought is the, the school of thought of the chaos, of the confusion, of uh, the materialism, which actually does not see meaning anywhere. And um, uh, uh, cannot, in this way, they cannot understand reality. Uh, for them, uh, reality is a chaos, uh, a chance and a chaos. Um, so, okay, the other school is uh, telling us that everything has a meaning, deep meaning on many, many, many levels. And uh, in this way, the astrology is a part of this school, which uh, tries to uh, to get deeper into reality, to to see reality, the the inner deep meaning of the interconnections of everything, of the inner meaning of everything. Uh, so uh, in this way, there is this uh, unity of the sky and the earth and it is not by outward outward particles you know or gravitational force or uh, whatever you know uh, material uh, kind of uh, explanation of astrology uh, it is it is more uh, it is more like the connection of uh, of inner association the connection of of events which are connected in a in a, in a way in a in a spiritual way in a existential way um, and um, this is uh, the basis of uh, astrology um, actually so all right now let's get to the real topic so, which is, uh, okay, now it's, uh, we have how many more minutes? 40, 40 more minutes, right? Oh, we have time. So, uh, we will start with some absolutely amazing uh, events in history. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great gets an, an army of about 50,000 people and he uh, dashes dashes through the through the straits through the Dardanella straits and with his aim to conquer the whole world so uh, he has uh, several successful battles and after several very good battles for him Somewhere, yeah, in the 331 BC, in 331 BC, the king of Persia, Darius II, decides to teach this guy a lesson. So he gathers an enormous army. By the ancient accounts, Darius uh, 
summons around one million people, one million warriors. Uh, so he he uh, gathers this enormous army. He has also two hundred uh, um, chariots, battle chariots. So he gathers his enormous army, and he goes to meet the fifty thousand of Alexander the Great. So uh, Darius picks up; he chooses the place of the battle. This is Darius, the Persian king himself. He himself chooses with his generals. He chooses the place of the battle, which is Gaugamel, Gaugamel, the famous, the famous battle. It is, it is believed, uh, it is believed that that this is near present day Erbil in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, around what is called Tel Gomel. Like a hill, a hill tell uh, called Gomel. Uh, it is believed that the battle took place there. So uh, it was, it was a very nice place for the army of Darius. It was, uh, it was flat, uh, and uh, for a huge army, this was the best place. So not only this, but Darius uh, gave orders that this, this area, this, this whole place should be uh, worked, worked on, like they will, they, 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 he, he sent uh, a, a big part of his army to prepare the place, to prepare the place for the battle, that the place be very, uh, very good uh, for his army that they will, for example, if if there is uh, something like a, like a, a heap a heap of of uh, earth somewhere, they will flatten it. They will flatten it. They will tramp everything. They will they will make uh, everything flat and good and good for a battle with uh, a huge army. Uh, also. Also, there was event like before the battle. The battle took place in the in the morning, on the first of October, three hundred thirty-one BC, which was the twenty-fourth of Ulu, the sixth month in the Babylonian calendar. So, uh, there was another another thing here. Like when Alexander the Great discussed the battle, the the battle which was going to happen. With his generals, uh, some of his generals suggested that they attack in the night. They said, "Hey, look, Alexander, this is huge army. We we cannot win this battle. You must be crazy. Uh, we better use some ruse and attack in the night." And Alexander the Great said, "Ah, no, 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 no. I, I will not. Uh, I will rather win this battle in the bright daylight, in the, in the, in the flat battlefield, and show the whole world who is the boss here. Uh, I will not let uh, this uh, happen in in such a way." that uh, the later generations may accuse me of treachery and using some, some such kind of uh, not very uh, brave uh, and uh, legal uh, ways, you know, like this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, snickery, snickery kind of, uh, kind of tricks, you know, to win the battle. No, I win it on the open battlefield. In the daylight, like a real guy, like a real man, uh, and uh, also this danger that Alexander the Great may attack during the night was aware Darius and his generals. So, so Darius gave uh, orders that uh, a big part of his army 
was to be ready for the battle and stay the whole night. Uh, so a big part of, of this huge army spent the night um, ordered, ordered in lines and waiting for Alexander the Great to attack during the night, which did not happen. So, okay. <clears throat> So uh, what happened, we know there are movies, there are books, there are religions. However, however, one thing, okay, yeah, Alexander the Great <coughs> was victorious with, with uh, uh, 50,000 men against 1 million or half a million, well, the same thing. So this is something that everybody knows. Now let me show you. Let me start sharing the screen. All right. Now I will. Uh, let me see here. All right. All right. This must be here. All right. So let me show you here something. All right, this is the chart of uh, the battle. It, it started in the morning with the sunrise. Um, and this is ancient depiction. I think was this somewhere from Pompeii or uh, Italy somewhere found? I, I, I'm not sure. So uh, anyway, anyway, um, Mm, as I was telling you, very few, very few from the scholars and from the historians will discuss one a very, very important event on the sky, celestial sign, celestial event, which was observed by everybody almost in this area. It was observed by the army of Alexander the Great. It was observed by uh, most of the people who lived in Mesopotamia and Iran. Uh, so there was this powerful celestial event which happened before the battle. What was this? This was a total lunar eclipse. All right, look, the battle happened on the 1st of October. And uh, somewhere around 10, 11 days before that happened the total lunar eclipse on the 20th of September. And in the Babylonian calendar, it happened on the 14th of Luke. Very, very important. Because, <clears throat> okay, this was a powerful celestial event, total lunar eclipse. Uh, all right, so this is the chart of, of the total lunar eclipse. This is made with my computer program, Plats do 7, with this module, Porphyrius Magus module, which is for ancient astrology. So look here. Okay, the moon is like in the first degree of Babylonian Aries. This is the Babylonian uh, zodiac here. Okay, so the moon is like in the in the first degree of Babylonian uh, Aries. The sun is in the first degree of Babylonian Libra, and this is uh, the time when uh, this total lunar eclipse happened. So. Uh, <laughs> the some of the Greek uh, historians they recorded that uh, the army of Alexander the Great was watching the lunar eclipse, and in this time Alexander the Great was sleeping in his tent. Uh, while while the whole army uh, 
was watching uh, amazed this this kind of absolute uh, uh, interesting phenomenon. Uh, Alexander the Great didn't give a penny about this. He, he just slept in his tent, absolutely sure in his fate, absolutely sure in his destiny, because he knew he knew who he is. Uh, well, many many people knew actually most most of the people knew who Alexander the Great was. Um, and I will just mention, I will just uh, may I will just ask you uh, to recall uh, this uh, event with the horse, all right? Uh, like this uh, Bucephalus, Bucephalus uh, horse, uh, Bucephalus, which uh, was the horse that Alexander the Great. Uh, rode in this battle and uh like this was a uh, event like this horse was brought by some Thracian king like a uh, like a gift to his father and nobody was able even to approach this horse he was so wild uh, and nobody could uh, could ride him nobody could even uh, even approach this this wild Black horse. I think he was a black horse with 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 white speck on his uh, forehead. So anyway, uh, Alexander the Great was a small boy, like fifteen years old, when he very very calmly approached the horse and rode rode the horse at once like this. Uh, so as I as I was telling you, uh, we. You know, we cannot believe easily the people, but the animals will never lie. So, uh, all right, anyway. So uh, <clears throat> this is the total lunar eclipse here. And what is important? What is important here? What is important here? Okay, this is a celestial event. This is a powerful thing, a powerful celestial event. And uh, what is the interpretation? This is the question here. How will we interpret this event? All right, the way of interpretation of this event is with the day when it happened and with the month when it happened. The day and the month. So it is the 14th of Ulu. All right. Why is this so important? Because every day in the lunar month is associated with a given country. Especially these days where are possible the solar and the lunar eclipses. So these days, like uh, on, on which lunar days are possible the lunar eclipses, okay? This is the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, and the 16th. So each of these days has a corresponding country. And also each of the months, each of the months, has a corresponding country. Like there are, there are four groups of months, which uh, basically correspond, we can draw this association with the zodiacal signs. Uh, so there are four groups of months which correspond to four countries, big kingships, uh, big kingdoms. So, all right, the 14th, the 14th of the lunar month was associated from the ancient, from the ancient Babylonian texts. The 14th lunar day is associated with Elam. 
And Elam, as we know, Elam is was a very ancient uh, kingdom which was to the east of Mesopotamia. It was in the present day Iran. All right, there is there is one river in the present day Iran, which uh, is a tributary to uh, to Tigris, I think, and uh, along this river in the present day Iran, to the east of Babylon, to the east of Mesopotamia, was this kingdom Elam. Actually, Elam uh, is in the place of Persia. The Persia, the Persia, the empire of Darius um, was at the same place like Elam before, before this. So, uh, Everybody knew that uh, the 14th lunar day is the day of Persia. So, you know, it is obvious that this total eclipse of the moon has to do with Persia, with Darius. Not only this, but the moon, Ulu. Ulu is also associated with Persia. The month and the day. This is too much, right? Too much. Uh, so uh, when this total eclipse happened, everybody knew. Everybody knew who will be hit very, very hard. Persia and Darius. So uh, uh, let's and this is not everything actually this is not everything because also there is one one phenomenon which is uh, which is called uh, uh, when god sees god which means that uh, the sun and the moon are on the horizon one on the eastern the other one on the western and uh, this phenomenon is for example, okay, when when the moon is rising, uh, when the moon is increasing, at the sunset we can see the moon, right? At every sunset we can see the moon. Every day the moon gets higher, higher, higher. Then she goes down, down, down to the eastern horizon when the sun is setting. Uh, the moon approaches uh, the eastern horizon with every day, and one day she cannot be seen at the sunset. This is uh, the day when, when the moon uh, is seen around the eastern horizon at the sunset for the last time. For the last time, this is usually usually this is the day of uh, of uh, that day uh, uh, the day which separated uh, the first part of the lunar month from the second one. You know, the first part is the increasing moon. Uh, the second part is uh, decreasing. Uh, of course, now we have a, a different uh, understanding of this, but in this in this time, this was it. And uh, this day, this day was important. Which day from the lunar month this will this will be? And uh, it happened here on on the thirteenth again. So okay, here is a modern uh, kind of uh, painting which is uh, inspired by the ancient one. Uh, this is Alexander the Great killing everybody around who is on his, on his way, who is uh, standing uh, uh, on, his, on his path. Uh, so here, this is here Darius in, in great uh, distress and panic. All right, so you know how the battle went. So, all right, so now, uh, very, very interesting. There is this book here. All right, look here. Astronomical Diaries, okay, volume one. Uh, Zach Skunga. This is a book where we can find, actually, we can find description of the celestial events and even historical events. So this is, 
this is in uh, normalized uh, with uh, with Latin uh, the text, and this is the translation here. So look here, the thirteenth. All right, moonset to sunrise. So on the thirteenth, they say it was this day when the sun and the moon were on the on the horizon one on the eastern the other on the uh, western this this is the important uh, day the 13th remember this this is uh this is uh um, important so here lunar lunar eclipse okay there was lunar eclipse there were okay there was some kind of, they they say also that there was lightning flashed okay fall of fire which i believe this was like uh like meteor showers and maybe a meteorite too uh, okay fall of fire all right mm, then description of the planets where they are the moon all right <laughs> and then here look here this is all right this is the other one so here all right so look here <clears throat> okay on the 24th in the morning the king of the world which is darius okay they fought with each other and a heavy defeat of the troops of darius okay the troops of the king deserted him and went to their cities they fled to the land of the Guti. uh yeah the Guti is northeast somewhere there in the mountains between Mesopotamia and uh, Iran. So, okay, here we have description of the celestial event and we have description also of the historical event. So, uh, okay, here also is written, okay, on the 11th in Sipar, on order of Alexander, I shall not enter your, ho your, your houses. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, Alexander the Great was, was able to build this vast empire only because he was noble, only because he was friendly, noble to uh, to these guys that he defeated, actually. So uh, obviously he has given order uh, to his troops to be civilized, not to touch anything, and to behave, to behave good as a good, uh, as a good uh, moral, moral guys uh so yeah uh, all right so all right so uh, all right this is this is actually the book that we were talking about uh the babylonian astrolabe okay here this is about this uh this day this uh these pages here are taken uh from my book the babylonian astrolabe and here i explain uh what is the meaning of the phrase god sees god god which means the sun sees the moon the moon sees the sun there on the opposite sides of the horizon and this happens in one of the lunar days and it can be you know it can be from the 12th to the 16th i believe all right here i explain what this means all right here is uh all right the sun and the moon all right, yeah. So it could be the 12th, the 13th, the 15th, 16th, and 17th. All right, so what is the meaning? Here we can, this is again from, from my book, so we can find some uh, the meaning of this in uh, Enuma Nu and Lil, which was the Bible for the Babylonian astrologer. All right, here is translation of this. So, okay, let's find what does this mean if this happens on the 13th day? Okay, if the moon and the sun see, see each other on the 13th day of the lunar month, the speech is not true, the ways of the land are not virtuous, there will be troops of the enemy. The enemy will take hold of the land. Oh boy. Ah. So, uh, Okay, it is 4.25, we have 15 more minutes. Let's, okay, this is like, uh, 
one possible moment of this uh, of this uh, day, the 13th of Lul. You see here the sun on the right, the moon on the left. This is uh, the last sunset in this month when we could still see the moon over the eastern horizon. The next day, the moon will not be seen. So this, this day, which, is, which happened on the 13th of Ulul, is considered like this very, very important uh, day when the sun sees the moon for the last time at the time of the sunset. So, okay, let's continue. This is another moment here, which, uh, which uh, happens on the 13th uh, for Lul. Okay, the moon is setting and the sun has still not risen. So this, uh, this, this moment is yeah, after the, after the, the, the uh, previous chart. So, well, whoever wants to know more. Okay, ah, this here is, what I was talking about, every lunar day, especially this when uh, are possible uh, lunar eclipses, is connected with a country. So you see here, Elam, the 14. And also the months, like the 1st, the 5th, the 9th, which actually make a trine, like... This is, we can associate this with the zodiacal signs, like, okay, the first uh, modern uh, tropical Aries, the fifth tropical Leo, the ninth tropical Sagittarius, these are the fiery signs, uh, the fiery months, they are associated with Aka, and the 13th, the 13th uh, lunar, uh, lunar, lunar day. So Elam, Elam, which is to the east of Mesopotamia, which is Persia, is associated the 14th, the 14th day, and this month, Airu, Ulu, and Tebet. Airu is the second, Ulu is the sixth, Tebet is the tenth. All right. Uh, okay, Subartu. Subartu is north, north of north of uh, Mesopotamia. It is actually where Assyria was, is associated with the 16th day, Subar two, the 16th day, and with the fourth, eighth, and the 12th month. Okay, this is imp this is important for what we will discuss later. If 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 we have time, let's see. Uh, we have uh, 11 more minutes. So okay, here is here it is. You see, so Mesopotamia is here on the south Sumer. In the middle, in, in the middle, Babylonian Akkad, in the north is Subartu, Assyria, on the east is Elam, in the south, south, uh, west is Amuru, the desert. So, uh, okay, now we will go to one very, very interesting case here of uh, Esarchadon or Asarchadon. Uh, somebody will will uh, will uh, tell his name. So this guy was the son of uh, the emperor of Assyria, uh, Sennacherib, and uh, he is the father of the famous Ashur Banipal. And uh, in in his in his title was uh, that he was uh, the revenger of his father, who was killed. His father was killed by two of his own sons. Uh, es Esarchadon, which, which was the, the youngest son, defeated after the killing, defeated this, uh, this, uh, his brothers and uh, became an uh, emperor. You know, so he was also like the restorer of Babylon and conqueror of Egypt. So uh, he ruled 12 years, just as Alexander the Great, Napoleon, and Hitler. So, um, okay, there is a, some kind of prehistory here. Okay, like uh, Sennacherib. Sennacherib in 689, in 689 BC, destroyed, destroyed Babylon. And eight 
and eight years later he was killed by his own sons eight years later one winner cycle and how was he killed very very interesting too like uh Sennacherib, when he first became emperor he built a major temple of dedicated to nergal nergal is like uh the mars the mars nergal is uh the the god who rules the underworld the world of the dead he is associated with plagues with war with bloodshed with killing uh mars in his uh, worst uh, uh face so uh Sennacherib built this famous temple uh, then he destroyed babylon eight years after the destruction of babylon he was killed by his own sons and uh how was he killed he was killed when he was praying in a temple in which temple the text does not say but i believe that it was the same temple that he built the temple to nergal so he was killed as he was praying to the god of the god of killing so uh Senachirip, uh, yeah uh, and very very interesting is also that he was killed on the 20th of Tebet. on the 20th of Tebet, which is the 20th uh, lunar day is dedicated to shamash the sun which is uh the divinity of justice so i i believe this is connected to uh his his death is connected with the destruction of uh babylon so okay esarhadon came after him he he was uh, uh you know he was uh he ruled for 12 years he restored babylon his great dream was to conquer egypt and he made two campaigns 673 bc and which was not very successful and then two years later was successful in 671 and he erected this stele you see here this stele he is this he is this is here uh esarchadon you see esarchadon here standing tall standing standing proud a character uh a winner and here in in robes here uh very very miserable is the son of the egyptian pharaoh he 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 could not uh take prisoner the pharaoh but he took prisoner his son uh so all right so all right we don't have time to discuss these are divinities here you see here the moon, the sun, and here the star connected with uh, Ishtar. And I think the first one here is uh, Asur. Then this is Ishtar. Then this is Nabu. And this guy here is holding this kind of lightning. Is of course, Adat, the god of storm. So, all right. So, uh, all right. Uh, so what happens? What happens is like, uh, like let's see when is this? This is six six minus six 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 eight, which uh, which is like uh, uh, six hundred sixty nine BC. Um, you know something happened with this guy after 673 bc like this was his first campaign in egypt and in this time something happened with this guy he started to develop some kind of unexplained sickness with many many different kind of uh, symptoms like vomiting dizziness uh, no energy depression uh, skin skin rash well all kinds of crazy things and and nobody could heal him and no, no priest, no magician, no, no astrologer, no, no doctor knew what the hell is happening here. So, uh, well, I suppose that you know this happened after his first campaign in Egypt. So, okay, uh, all right. So he conquered e e Egypt in 671. But what happened? <clears throat> 
in, in 669 <coughs> BC, uh, Mars and Saturn on the, on the 16th of Adar, Mars and Saturn close, came to close conjunction. Like they were like, you could not see them separated. They were like one star, very, very bright because Mars was like minus 1.5, 1.7. And you add also Saturn there, and boom. So, uh, and also at the time of the full moon, there was a hollow around the moon. This, this big uh, circle of 22 degrees uh, radius around the moon, which was encircling, encircling uh, Saturn and Mars. And, and also speaker too. Yeah, this was a big circle here. <clears throat> and this happened on the 16th of Adar. Also on the same day, on the, on the same day happened uh, this uh, God sees, uh, sees, uh, sees God. So, okay, think about this. This kind of, of omen, Saturn and Mars, absolute tight conjunction you know, like they were like one star. They they became one star. And the moon with them, the full moon below them, below them, as you can see here, you see, you see the moon here. All right. The moon is below them. And this Saturn and Mars both are here in this point. So, all right. And <clears throat> this is something not very nice, right? And when, when did this happen? This happened on the 16th, all right? On the 16th, on the 16th of Adar. So do you remember which country was connected with the 16th lunar day and with Adar? All right, let's check. Let's check, let's go up here. Oh boy, super two. The 16th day, <clears throat> Super 2 also is connected with the month of Adar. So this has to do with Super 2, which is Assyria. <clears throat> and, and this guy, Esar Hadon, is actually uh, the emperor of Assyria. So it is absolutely obvious that this has to do with him. And this was not a good, a good omen. So, okay, astrological reports to Assyrian kings, here state archives of Assyria, volume eight. So uh, Esarchadon wrote to the magicians, to the astrologers, he required explanation and he received nine, I think we have nine letters from astrologers, magicians, priests to Esarchadon on the topic of this omen. And you see, many of them will try to console him. Uh, some of them were more realistic. Okay, like, look, look here. From Nabu, Ahe, Eriba. Okay, the moon is surrounded by a hail and mast and in it, loss of cattle, uh, of all lands, the date, okay, we'll probably, all right. Uh, all right, so if the plough star reaches the path of the sun, Famine of cattle, there will be famine, Mars will reach Saturn. So this is cold, cold word, pluff. Pluff star uh, is Mars and the path of the sun is Saturn, cold words, all right? So, okay, from another astrologer, Balassi, I think he was from Babylon. Okay, uh, okay, look here. If the moon becomes late, which means the 16th day, uh, sun and moon were on the horizon, uh attack of a ruling city all right and and here he says it sets on the 15th day and is seen with the sun on the 16th day yeah he he says it here all right so if the raven star reaches the path of the sun okay it's on so the raven star is uh, mars the path of the sun is saturn so all right uh Okay, he here is making a consolation, like, oh, this this is concerning a cat. Oh, really? Oh, really? This is concerning a cat? No way. This is not concerning a concerning a cat. This is concerning Assyria. 
Uh, all right, so. Okay, if the moon is surrounded by a halo and the planet is standing in it, a robbers will rage. Well, yeah, there are all this here that you can probably later when you get the the chance to get the video you can you can read for uh for yourself so what we see here is a discussion of this uh, of this woman the king was very very worried and he was worried rightly so because guess what happened guess what happened only one month after this omen, the Egyptian pharaoh revolted and he started campaign. He started campaign and he drove out the Assyrian garnison almost to the delta, you know, and he was and he was fighting there. So Esarchedon, uh, when he learned this, he gathered enormous army and he went uh, and he went uh, to uh, Egypt in order to, you know, to to give justice there, uh, to reclaim uh, Egypt, and uh, he went through Haran. Haran, Haran is uh, a city on the path of uh, the troops. So he went to Haran, and he stayed there for several days. And guess what happened there? He died. Esarhaddon died on his way to Egypt in Haram, six months, six months after this omen happened. So, okay, uh, I have here one more thing about Asur Banipal for one minute. All right, Asur Banipal was ruling for 40 years. He destroyed Alam, he was astrologer. This is him here. And he, when he became king, Two months, two months after his coronation, so to say, Jupiter rose heliacally, appeared heliacally in the sign of cancer, his own sign of exaltation, of elevation. Jupiter MF0, morning first zero, appeared, appeared, appeared on the 18th of Siman. Uh, my uh, minus 667 here okay and this is two months after he was proclaimed for king and he got a letter a congratulational letter from uh asharedu one of the astrologers who was also astrologer of his father and he says here okay it is jupiter okay is seen in front of cancer stands in the path of Enlil, where is his position? Enlil, the path of Enlil is his path. And it's light, carried radiance, okay. The king of Akkad will become strong, all right. So this is, yeah, this is a good, a very, very good. Uh, and here, look here, at the beginning of your kingship, Jupiter was seen in his true position <coughs> in Cancer, in the path of uh, Enlil. <laughs> May the Lord of the gods make you happy and extend your days. And yes, he was 40 years king. All right. All right. That's it here. Here is uh, again something about uh, this succession of the kings. So, all right. Uh, we are out of time right now. <clears throat> I'm, I have finished. Okay. Thank you, Ruben. It was so interesting. I've... I, I hope we had more time that you, you could uh, speak more. Do you want to add something? Well, hi, hi. This is uh, what I wanted to tell you. This, these are very, very absolutely amazing stories, absolutely fascinating stories. And there are many more. There are many, many more. But you know they they mostly get overlooked overlooked by the historians by the scholars because most of them uh, they their set of mind is different uh, and they are dependent you know they cannot talk what they want actually and they are brainwashed too most most of them 
So uh, there are many of these stories, many. All right. We have a lot of to explore, a lot. Amazing stories indeed. <laughs> Yeah, amazing stories indeed. So everybody is thanking at the moment. I don't see any question. Ah, pardon, pardon. One thing that I want yes. to, to add here. I believe that Esarchadon was killed with very big prob probability by Egyptian magic. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's okay, maybe perhaps next though. time, yeah, in another uh, presentation, you can explain us through that. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question to Roman. Yeah. What, is, what is your feeling and what is your uh, understanding? What is the difference between this kind of astrology of ancient Babylonian, Akkadian, Shumerian people? And immediately after this, um, what's happened with... Uh, astrology after immediately after this period do you think egyptians have their own school during this great kings of uh, akkadian people uh, uh whether they had their own school of uh what of astrology astrology of course oh of course of course of course of course they did well, you know, I, I believe that there was several moments when uh, there was this uh, exchange of culture, of knowledge between Mesopotamia and uh, Egypt. Several, several moments. Like, uh, I think the first one was Sargon the Great, 2400 BC. And then the last one was uh, actually in the time of the New Babylonian Empire, which is which was somewhere in the in the uh, seventh century BC, uh, when actually Egypt was was conquered, and then and then there we have uh, evidence that in this time of the new Babylonian uh, Empire, which thrived only for 120 years around the seventh century BC, we have evidence that actually in Egypt <clears throat> the the upper strata of the society, the scholars, the priests, the, in, the intelligentsia, they studied, they studied Akkadian. And they, and, and they found even, uh, you know, tablets with cuneiform myths and writings in Egypt. And, and there the Egyptian guys who, who read these tablets, uh, we could still see how they, you know, noted some words that they didn't know and something like that, you know, like, you see. Yes. I ask you about this because in, in my presentation, I will show how definitely uh, something happened in uh, Thebes, the great kingdom, uh, the great uh, capital of the middle and new kingdom of Egypt. And not only Egypt astrology is visible there, not only uh, Hellenistic astrology is visible there, but it, there are visible uh, some constellations which came from Akkadian and Shumerian origins. And from this perspective, mm, we see one uh, enormously powerful mixture. But why in Tivas, uh, the, the great capital, where is the Luxor, where is uh, this great temple there? And uh, the place of, of the kings and queens uh, that they go after life. and Definitely, definitely, this was a place of mixture of astrological schools and um, something important was written there. Why? Because some special omens is only visible from, from this place. And uh, I think uh, the source of astrology is exactly this mis mixing of uh, Babylonian, Shumerian tradition and Egypt tradition uh, of astrology. Okay, thank you 